A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. At that time, the Lord appointed 72 others whom he sent ahead of him in pairs to every town and place that he intended to visit. Jesus said to them, The harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the harvest master to send out laborers for his harvest. Now go on your way. Behold, I am sending you like lambs among wolves. Carry no money bag, no sack, no sandals, and greet no one along the way. Into whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this household. Now if a peaceable person lives there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Now stay in the same house and eat and drink whatever is offered to you, for the laborer deserves his payment, but do not move about from house to house. Now, whatever town you enter and they welcome you, eat what they set before you and and cure the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God is at hand for you. Now, whatever town you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, The dust of your town that clings to our feet, even that we shake off against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God, I tell you, is at hand. It will be more tolerable for Sodom on that day than for that town. Now the seventy-two returned rejoicing, and they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us because of your name. Jesus said, I have observed Satan falling like lightning from the sky. Behold, I have given you the power to tread on serpents and scorpions and upon the full force of the enemy, and nothing will harm you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice because the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Don't rejoice because the devils are subject to you. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And the question is, how do I get on the list? I want to be on that heaven list. And today Jesus tells us how to get on that list. But we've got to pay attention to the comma. And I've got a little bit of a gripe with both the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed because because of the comma. They tell us that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, comma, suffered under Pontius Pilate. And you say, well, what happened in between? He's born and now he's suffering. Did anything go on in between? And of course, the crooks of who we are as followers of Jesus is in the in-between. You know, Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II now, gave us these luminous mysteries. And my favorite mystery is what's going on in between. What's going on between born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate? It is this. The third mystery is the proclamation of the kingdom. Today we have Jesus sending out not his 12, but the 72, the disciples' disciples. And they're learning the ways of Jesus and they're getting what Jesus is trying to say. So he's going to send them out to proclaim the kingdom and to go into all the towns and the villages and saying, it's coming, it's coming, it's at hand. All you need to do is open up your eyes and you're going to see it. Now the question is, what in the world is this kingdom? Well, it is so deep, it is so profound that there are no words that are going to describe it. As a matter of fact, the best that even Jesus can do is by analogy. Well, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like... 12 virgins. The kingdom of God is is like a man who buried a treasure. The kingdom of God. What is it? It is nothing less than seeing through the eyes of God. Seeing, in this case, through the eyes of Jesus. Because Jesus is seeing something radically different from the others. He's, he's He's seeing something that is Incredible, because he's had this profound experience of his oneness with God, whom he calls his Father. And he wants us to have exactly the same experience. So he's calling us to to open our eyes that we may see, know that it's at hand. And some are going to get it and some are going to not get it. Some are going to see it, some are not going to see it. He says, the ones who see it, well, then you stay in their house and you feed them. The ones who don't, you know, they're not ready. 
It's, it's kind of like a joke, either you get it or you don't get it. Either you see it or you don't see it. And really it depends an awful lot and we don't know how or why when all of a sudden the veil parts or the scales fall off our eyes and, and we get it. I'm, I'm seeing what God sees. And it's already in me and yet it's not quite there. I'm not there. It's already but not yet. Isaiah today is trying to describe it in the first reading. He's saying, oh, rejoice in Jerusalem. Of course, Jerusalem is a code word for all of humankind in, in this holy city. And he's giving this beautiful, poetic picture of, of utter contentment, of being one with reality. And what's that wonderful picture? It's the picture of a, a child at its mother's breast, perfectly content, being fed, no anxiety, no fear, just marvelous. It's already here. And yet it's really not really here. It's not yet. Obviously it's not yet. If we look at the whole situation of what's going on in Jerusalem today, what are we seeing? Yeah, you look at the modern day Jerusalem and we see walls being built between people, settlements being built so that other people cannot be on land and the brink of war for as long as I can remember for as long as I can remember. And yet, and yet, in that same city, there are Palestinians and there are Jews who literally see themselves as sisters and brothers and will do everything they can to break down the walls and the barriers that are keeping them from each other. And we got a name for these people. We call them kingdom people. Because whose eyes are they seeing through? They're seeing through the eyes of the Christ. Now, obviously the Palestinians are going to not, they'll probably be saying we're seeing through the eyes of Mohammed or through the eyes of Allah, but they may have a whole different name for the divinity, but they're seeing through this same set of eyes. Now the question is, how in the world do you get from not seeing to seeing? From not getting it to getting it? from living a very superficial life to living an incredibly deep life. It is the life of the kingdom of God. How do you do that? Well, St. Paul gives us a, well, he gives us more than a hint. Today, he actually tells us how it's done. And St. Paul says, if I'm going to boast, if I'm going to brag about anything, all right, I'm going to brag about the cross of Christ. Oh, excuse me, if you're living in Jewish times, the cross of Christ is the greatest scandal in the world. What he's talking about is incredible suffering. And, and he is inviting us into that same experience. Not an easy experience, a very difficult experience. And yet, I've discovered that there are two things that can break through our superficiality and our living on the outside to bring us into the inside. One is great love and the other is great suffering. And any of you who are parents know what great love is. Right? You've got a colicky baby and you're up five, ten, twelve times a night taking care of your baby and you are exhausted and you can't see straight, but you're going to do whatever it takes. Because what the kingdom is always going to call us to do is take us outside of ourself. Take us somewhere else. Take us to a, a different place and a different way of seeing. That kind of love is more than even evolution requires. Huh? And those of you who are parents know what kind of love that is. That's, that's transforming you. How do we transform from the superficial into the deep? into the real. The other is suffering. Nobody wants to suffer. Nobody wants to suffer. And yet suffering seems to be the only thing sometimes that's going to destabilize our imperial ego that always wants to be in control. And what suffering basically says is, I'm not in control. I can't do it. No matter how hard I've tried, no matter how smart I am, no matter how much money I've made, my life is still falling apart. When I come to that realization, I fall through into something deeper. 
much more profound into the hands of the living God. The moment I say, oh my God, all that which is superficial is gone and I am now entering into what St. Paul is going to call a brand new creation. There's a radical difference between the superficial life that most of us live and the deep life that we are called to live. And that's the life of the kingdom. And that life, Paul says, I mean, you're radically new. You know, the symbol of that is when we baptize a baby, then we say it's a new creation. It's going to spend the rest of its life understanding what it means to be a new creation because the kingdom of God is already there. God's already in you, but it's not yet fully manifested. Eckhart Tolle in his book, The Power of Now, when his whole life had completely fallen apart, he had all these degrees and all this knowledge and everything he was touching was turning to garbage. And he remembers, he said, one day I was looking in the mirror and he says, I can't stand myself. I can't stand myself. And all of a sudden, the light went on. He says, who is this I that can't stand myself. Are there two of me? Are there two of me? Oh no, there's only one of me, but there are two radically different realities within me. Myself, the one I couldn't stand, is what he calls the egoic self or the, or the self that is reputational or the self that is exterior or the persona that we project on other people or all the things that are going to die when we die. That's the outside world. That's the outside world. The I, who I truly am, is who I am in God. Nothing more, nothing less. Oh, but that's enough. That is the baby sitting on its mother's lap and sucking from her breast. That is utter contentment. That is peace. That is a place where nothing, no one can harm you. Thomas Merton called it the difference between what is the false self or the outer self, the egoic self, our reputational self, and our true self. Who we really, truly are. When St. Paul comes to this, he says that at this point now, it doesn't make any difference whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised. The only thing that counts is that you're now new. You're now in the kingdom or you're close to the kingdom, or you're working toward the kingdom, you are a new creation. Well, now, when the Jews heard this, they had to go nuts because their entire identity was wrapped up in the fact that they were different from the Gentiles. Why? Because they had a sign. What was their sign? Their sign was the circumcision. This was the sign of the covenant. How dare you say that it's not important? And Paul's saying... Well, it ain't. No, it's not. Whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised doesn't mean a hill of beans. He has just destroyed their superficial identity. I dare say the greatest problem that we are facing right now is that we are caught in our superficial identities. We are so polarized right now. Why? Because we have so over-identified. Huh? We hear terms like identity politics or identity religion. We talk about the identity that the, the bombers in the Twin Towers had and that's caused them to hate everybody else who did not have their identity or saw the world the way that they see the world. We've got all these multiple identities, whether it's a political identity or a religious identity or a cultural identity or a racial identity, and we think that that's who we are. That's not who we are. That's not the true self. That's the false self. That's the egoic self. You cannot say, thy kingdom come, until you are willing to say, my kingdom go. Until you are willing to say, my little world has to go. There's something bigger, there's something much more powerful, there, there's something much more ah, creative, alive. And our work is to find it. 
What I'm proclaiming to you today is good news. Your work is to allow that good news to penetrate into your heart and then ask yourself, what's keeping us, what's keeping me from entering into the kingdom? I think Satan is having a field day in getting us to hate each other. In getting us to think that if we are one political party or another political party, we are all good and the other is all bad. That's a lie. That's an illusion. The truth is that 99.8% of all human beings have exactly the same DNA. We're not different. We're all the same. The only difference is between those who get it and those who don't. Those who are living consciously aware of the presence of the divine in them and seeing through that lens and those who are unconsciously clinging to this false identity that's going to die when we die. When you get to the pearly gates, Peter's not going to ask if you were a Republican or a Democrat. He doesn't care whether you were circumcised or uncircumcised. Not important. He's going to say, were you in Christo? Were you in Christ? That's what he's going to ask. That was Paul's code word, you know. Paul uses the term en Christo, in Christ, 72 times. And of course, the Christ that he's talking about isn't Jesus of Nazareth. It's the cosmic Christ. It's the divine presence shot through all of the universe. Shot through all of humanity. Shot through all of creation. And the question is, can you see it? The 72 come back rejoicing, rejoicing. Why? Even the demons are subject to us in your name, in the name of the Christ, in the name of the truth. And Jesus is smiling. He says, yeah, I know. I know. You went into the dark places and you named the illusions. And the moment you name your illusion, the moment you name your lie, the moment you go into your shadow and you see that dark part that you don't even want to look at, it has no more power. It has to fall from the sky. Satan is being conquered. You can be happy about that, but you want to really rejoice? Oh, rejoice in this. Your eyes are opened. You're seeing through the eyes of the Christ. You are now in heaven. <laughs>